All right, we're recording. I would like to start. Well, so um, speaking about investors and being able to put money in projects, like each project would have its own legal structure and mm. entity and bank account and things like that. So for yeah. us, it's like, how can we be the, um, the conductors of the band? I I'm curious even about that though, right? Like, do we really want to do the whole bank account thing? You know, like, um, like what would it be like to keep it in the crypto space, right? Where it's like, it's in, it's in crypto funds and maybe you'd probably want it to be a, uh, one of the kind of more stable coins or whatever, right? But that sort of idea of, um, I think that would also make it kind of like a little bit outside of the jurisdiction of, is it a business entity? Is it a like, who, who's, <laughs> well, we do get into potentially legal, legal challenges here, right? but like, if people, if we're keeping it all transparent, right, and people like there's this open ledger or whatever we call it, right, and you're running these projects that have some sort of specific purpose, and there's multiple projects, like you're saying, how can you make it such that, like, you know, I'm out here in China at the moment, you know, you're in the US, um, and as soon as you start doing bank accounts or you start doing like legal contracts or whatever, now we've got to say like, well, what legal jurisdiction are we talking about? Or bank account in what country? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about building this from the beginning outside of all of that, right? Like what is a way that we can have like an entire de decentralized system? Mm -hmm. where it's like, you can't tell where it is, right? Because it's not anywhere geographically. It's built on the, it's like built in the metaverse, right? It's a, it's a, it's a new way of holding space for entirely new projects to be built. Mm -hmm. You know what an escrow account is? Uh, sure. Like, yeah. Like what if you could have, uh, like in this fund? So I, 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 my initial thought with this was to create, do you have Venmo in China or like? Uh, I, I haven't used Venmo before and I don't think you can use it in China unless you're on a VPN, which, you know, you can use anything. Okay. My, my, my original thought was get a phone and create a Venmo account and then people could send Venmos to the account and then I could Venmo people out of the account, but it would never go into a bank account. It would just right, be yeah. into a Venmo. And it's like, so if you could have something like that, like a, a virtual escrow kind of account thing where it's like and 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 to your point around that you can have big donors like someone could send a million dollars but yeah. you also want it to be open up to everyone like if i just want to send five dollars then i get to be a part of this by just sending five bucks um and then and then people could essentially send requests to the account and then it mm -hmm. never goes it's never really owned by anybody it's just in this mm -hmm. it's just in this kind of yeah, it's in an it's in an entity that doesn't it's not owned by anybody. There's just this wallet, and it's it's not profit, it's not income, it's not a nonprofit. It's just a Venmo account that's not really tied to somebody. I'm wondering, you know, we'd have probably have to pull in someone from the crypto space to answer some of these questions. But like, I'm wondering how we can create some sort of a smart contract around that, whereby it's like, you know, it's clear how the funds can and cannot be used. So that it's not like, you know, built on integrity, built on, do I trust that person or not? It's kind of like, no, like if I send money into that, you know, whether it's Venmo or something else, it's not going to be used for something else because it's built into the smart contract, mm -hmm. you know, like it can only be used for these kinds of purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that would lend itself to kind of having, you know, both a certain level of credibility, but also, you know, safety for people to feel like, you know, it's, and, 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 and moving beyond the problem of investing in like, you know, investing in a founder, you know, that kind of idea is like, what if the founder, I don't know, gets sick? What if the founder turns out to be a crazy, you know, <laughs> a, a, a psychopath, you know, um, which, you know, ends up to be a lot of people in the top of the business world, right? But, um, you know, like that whole, how do we how do we create structures in which the people who are deciding to actually invest in stuff don't have to be reliant on well i trust that person right it's like you know i'm i'm 
I know that the, the funds are going to go into something like that. So therefore, like, I'm happy to do that. Um, and this is, I think, a bit more of a potentially complex conversation because like, how do you actually manage that, right? On a, on a systemic scale, how do you actually make sure that funds can only go to certain types of projects and stay within that ecosystem, right? Mm. Stay within the ecosystem. Yeah, there's a certain amount of like, because if you have a fund that is used for one thing, and then it's like, where do the funds, what like, where's the, where's the, where do the funds go, right? It's like, how do you, like right now we have funds which can be converted, right? You can convert it into, you know, cash, you can convert it into, and so I'm curious about how we create a system in which, you know, there aren't those loopholes where someone can come in and convert it into something else and that something else can then be pulled out of the system, right? Um, and this is what the whole, you know, space is about right now. It'd be great to pull in Sushant into this conversation and see like what's, what's feasible and what's not feasible. Because, you know, if I'm looking at this from the outside as someone who would be interested in sort of putting some money into something like this, it'd be like, I'd want to know, like, what is the pathway upon which that those funds could go, right? Like, as things enter into the crypto space, or as they, you know, enter into, you know, the dark side of the web, right, where things are less visible, it's like, where do things go, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, the traditional financial institutions technically are supposed to be able to take care of is like, we can track things, you know, and there's this legal way of making sure that if someone, you know, doesn't get paid, then, you know, they get paid in another way. Um, and it's like, well, if we're trying to create a system outside of that, how do we also have the checks and balances in there to make sure that the funds don't go somewhere that they're not supposed to go? Mm. Yeah, I mean, so for me, there's a few things come up quite a bit comes up in that but so there's like um so for me there's definitely a, a possibility of having um like an, a coin for the ecosystem like an internetwork coin where it's like okay we're all a part of this community together and we have coins that we trade when we are share our gifts with each other um and then there's and then for me there's there's the um whether it's cryptocurrency or fiat currency, like for me, when I look at, are you familiar with the fascial system in the body? Mm -hmm. It's like, I look at money in the world as like a fascial system. Like it's our interconnective tissue mm -hmm. and it's really traumatized in our world right now. Like it's calcified, it's dehydrated, right? It's like knotted up. And so for me, um, definitely a piece of what's being invited here is how could people introduce currency like introduce um lubricant like 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 chi life force energy like blood like what would be blood or water in the body and life force energy like into a global financial fabric to where we can actually move money to massage like some of the places where energy stuck in a system so it's like another metaphor yeah yeah very cool there's some other people kind of coming to mind now of people that would be interesting to pull into this conversation um i was going to have a conversation with uh fernando ibarra the other day um who's kind of working with uh sean as bjorn hargens is i don't know how you say his name properly mm -hmm. um who uh you know <laughs> I think he's the guy from Meta Interval, um, but he's created this kind of idea of like a new form of capital, like meta capital, right? Like different forms of capital that can be sort of measured or or tracked. And and then another another person that I'm thinking of, Stefan Segatori, the WeFlow guy. Mm -hmm. um, he kind of gets into this kind of financial space in kind of an interesting way, where it's like, how do you create like relationships whereby there's like a there's almost like a, a clear value that comes back, right? Or else, or else it's like the value comes back, right? It's like, there's a sort of like a time period almost where like, you know, the funds can be used for a certain type of thing. And if by that time, the value has not been created, those funds come back to where they originally 
came from, you know? And that's another kind of interesting concept, which I think wouldn't be applicable to all projects, but I think in some ways that might be a kind of thing that would be interesting. Um, like he uses it in the, in the practitioner space, where it's like, if you train with his protocol in the whole WIFO space, and you don't get the value back from that training within a certain time period, like you get your money back, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, basically, you know, um, the training is going to be valuable to you, right? Because, you know, it's going to create some sort of income or whatever. And that's an interesting, you know, kind of niche piece. But I'm kind of curious also about these bigger sort of uh, forms of capital, right? Like, like what you were mentioning there about the fascial system and the way that it, you know, gets massaged or, you know, how things flow into a certain space, right? Where it's like, how does that flowing mechanism happen, right? How is the like if we talk about the world and like the acupuncture points in the world of like trauma that needs to be healed or specific parts of, you know, like having grown up in Africa, there's like all these places that would really need, you know, certain funds, but you want to be careful about, you know, we've seen, you know, charities in Africa, NGOs, whatever that have gone in and just like wasted a whole lot of resources and not created anything sustainable on the ground, not to mind regenerative. Right. Um, and, and so that, that kind of question of, what are, what are the mechanisms by which these funds flow? Um, I'm imagining it has something to do with consciousness and how we direct our consciousness and how we kind of as a collective decide what to focus on. And I'm curious about what those mechanisms would look like. Like what are the decision-making mechanisms by which we could make decisions about things? Another thing that it's reminding me of is the, that AI that I read about a while ago where it's like, uh, like, collective, I don't even know if you call it AI, it's like collective decision-making in the moment, right? Where it's like, there's a, there's a, a potential, there's potentials to choose from. And then as, as you start to choose something, you get to see what other people are choosing. And then based on that, then you can modify your decision, right? So you might see that, you know, you want to choose this thing, but you see that lots of people are actually choosing this other thing that you really don't like, but there's enough people choosing the thing that is kind of okay. And so you're kind of like, okay, I won't choose this because nobody else is choosing this, but I'll choose that other thing because that's definitely a better option than the thing that I really don't want. Mm -hmm. And so kind of ways of ways of collective decision-making where we could sort of bring that, like you're talking about the fascial network, like the blood flow to that specific place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's almost like the, the inflammatory response or the sort of the autoimmune response or the, the within our body, you know, that brings the, like if I cut myself, right? Like you get all those, you know, good stuff in your body that comes and takes care of you, right? It's like on a global scale, if we're talking about these kind of projects, what, what are those mechanisms by which it brings the, the, the energy, the nourishment, the fuel to that specific point? Because mm -hmm. um, within our body, we have organic, organically built in biological mechanisms. And I'm curious about if we're building this new ecosystem, what those mechanisms might be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gosh, so much comes up for me in this. One thing is, um, so so one thing is that in this, like, let's say hypothetically, there is a Venmo account that people could put money into and that money could come out of, just for this example. That is necessarily getting away from this kind of centrally planned uh, reallocation of capital that has all mm -hmm. these negative externalities that you're pointing to, like in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a, a economics professor. Are you familiar with the Austrian School of Economics? No. Okay, so the, there. Um, that's a lot of what I studied in college is the Austrian School of Economics, but it's it's what we're talking about here, like emergent phenomena and how to marketplaces emerge out of the actions and interactions of individuals. And um, there's a book called Doing Bad by Doing Good by Chris Coyne where it talks about this, like, okay, we want to, like Tom Shoes is the most famous example ever of like, let's go in and do something good for people that just completely wrecked a local economy. Um, but so part of it, part of it is for me is um, getting away from that. Like, okay, we're not, not going into a place and saying, hey, we're just gonna reallocate capital, but actually how can we connect in, connect in with people and sense into what's trying to happen and then a really important distinction here is that when we're talking about the global, global acupuncture points and where these adhesions in the fabric of the financial system are, the, um, there's the combination of money with healing transformational work. Mm, yeah. 
that's a big piece. One of the things that's coming up for me around this whole thing is the challenge of, uh, I mean, because this is what kind of what I'm, I'm kind of we're leaning into here is like in the moment, direct democracy, right? Kind of, you know, like how do we collectively allocate resources in certain ways? And one of the challenges that, I mean, we can see on a global scale right now with, you know, people choosing things that they may not have a good understanding of the outcome of, right? Um, like, how do you how do you filter the decision making process whereby there's there's like a certain amount of awareness about a specific thing needed for certain decisions to be made about something? And I think that this is one of the areas that we 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 move into challenges of like you just talked about of the doing bad by doing good, right? It's like you can have a good intention around something, but if you don't have a good enough understanding of how that ecosystem works, you can destroy the ecosystem despite good intentions. And so that's one of the challenges of moving into collective action is if not enough humans within that collective have a good enough understanding of the ecosystem, there's real potential for the, the, the crowd effect to take control and to move things into places where they could actually be detrimental. Um, and so it's like finding that balance between moving in a collective way and having certain awarenesses within that collective that have specific, I don't know if knowledge or expertise is the right word, but specific um, understanding of that specific context to be able to make the kinds of decisions. So it's like if we if we look at holo holacracy as an example of kind of how this is done in the organizational structure, it's like people are given the the responsibility to be able to make decisions about what they need to make decisions about as long as they checked in with the relevant stakeholders, right? So it's like you know have a conversation with anyone that this is likely to affect, and then based on those conversations, make the decision. Right, you're trusted to make that decision, and so I'm curious about how that would be how that would be codified. Um, or like maybe if like if we're if we're moving towards smart contract type thing, it's like well there's a there's a challenge there's, there's an inherent challenge in the smart contract type. This is codified in and the human consciousness of like we trust that individual to make wise decisions. Um, and I'm curious about the balance between those and where smart contracts are more useful and where you actually trust human beings to make certain types of decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, the um, like aware awareness based systems, and how can you have? How can you have um, systemic, like individual person awareness, um, systemic awareness, collective awareness, awareness of awareness, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, and have all of that information come into a decision emerging and right emerging right now? Right, which which <laughs> which doesn't have a overarching sort of like one person or leader yeah. or whatever, right? That can veto and say, well, actually no, right? But yet at the same time, having enough mechanisms in place whereby if something is going wrong, right? There is a cutoff point. It's kind of like the question of, um, you know, like the, the, the AI singularity, right? Of kind of like, well, you know, we could build something that just like, you know, rips humanity apart and we may not know until it's too late kind of thing. So it's like, how do we make sure that as we're building something like this, that there's kind of like a, a, an off switch, you know, kind of thing built into the mechanism, whereby there are things that the awarenesses within the creation of this may not be aware of that may emerge out of this. In fact, that's very likely. Right. And and so, you know, inherently built into the design, how do you how do you build in something that can be stopped? Because otherwise, it's the runaway train, right? It's 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 something that can be created that can essentially destroy 
yeah. all systems everywhere, right? Um, and that's one of the challenges of kind of moving into this space of, um, you know, where like it's 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 an open field, it's an open territory. There's nothing, there's no examples for us to say. Well, you know, we've learned in the past that you shouldn't do this because nobody's done this before, right? This is entirely new, and the, the potential implications of that are not known. Mm -hmm. And so, like, how do you build? And I think that this is kind of getting back to the whole kind of ethical framework around AI and you know how you build systems that are ethical, because it's we need to be very careful about moving into a space that can that can create certain types of outcomes that are not overseen by a specific entity, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, how do you, because it's like, you could say, okay, but then we need a collective that can veto. But then it's like, what if that collective comes up with the same problem of, you know, they're moving in a direction they don't have enough good understanding of, right? So it's like that continual paradox of individual versus collective, right? The individual may have specific expertise in this specific area. Collective doesn't have enough to be able to make a wise decision, but the collective is maybe a more, you know, uh, uh, a more wide, right? Like they have a more wide understanding, right? And so it's like, how do you balance that between the in individual having deep and the collective having wide and being able to sort of work together such that there's enough trust in the individual to make decisions about the deep and there's enough kind of uh, capacity in the collective to make decisions about the wide, mm -hmm. but yet the, the deep and the wide are, often intertwined, right? So it's like the, 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 the relative complexity of that, right? To be able to distinguish between deep and wide mm -hmm. is not always readily apparent. In fact, sometimes it's very, very challenging to kind of piece apart. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's one of the things that we're seeing on the global scale right now is kind of like, democracy sounds like a fantastic idea, except when nobody really understands what's happening. And right now, nobody really understands what's happening. So how can we make decisions, right, about certain types of things? And, and yet it's like we see some leaders in the world that are really making very, very wise decisions. But how do you decide which leaders to actually give the capacity to or give the power to, to actually make the decisions that are going to be wise? And this is where I think part of what we're talking about is this whole kind of developmental framework built into the back end of everything, right, where it's like, you have built into it, and maybe even this is what's necessary in the real-time development, right? Like there's an AI in the background that's seeing that based on the developmental level that you're operating from right now, we're gonna allow you to do that, right? That's built into the smart contract, right? If you're operating from a, a stage of development where it's like you're seeing the complexity of this specific context, we, you have the capacity to actually make a decision about that, right? But if you're operating, let's say you crashed, because that's usually the problem with, leaders that we give power to, and then they make terrible decisions is because in that specific context, they've regressed into some sort of childhood pattern around something, some trauma that happened to them. And so it's like, if you had an AI in the background that could tell what's, what developmental perspective this person is coming from in the moment as they're making that decision, and somehow there's a collective developmental, like there's a there's a collective of other people operating at the developmental level that can kind of corroborate that, yes, that is happening right now. And that seems to be like a healthy perspective, but there's others in the system that are making decisions about other developmental decisions. It's kind of like there's, a, there's both the check and balance of the collective as well as uh, a sort of a, a smart contract type, you know, uh, built-in mechanism that can allow decisions to be made based on understanding cognitive complexity or developmental complexity. Mm -hmm. And if, if that kind of a system could be created, it's like, uh, yes, I could allow my funds to go into that because I'm happy to have people who can see that level of complexity make those kinds of decisions about those kinds of things. And in fact, you know, I'd be happy to trust them to do that. Now, the thing that I'm not happy with is if they that individual drops into a lower developmental sort of place because they're triggered about something and they're still making decisions about these things, that's a no-go, right? But if they are making decisions based in real time at a developmental stage where they can see the complexity of it, um, I think there would have to be an extra mechanism built in there around <laughs> maybe even uh, 
like a time period of like operating at a certain developmental level for a certain period of time, right? And this is where we get into the, the kind of the, the, the distinction between states and stages, which, <laughs> you know, some people make a very big distinction. I, I think there's an important distinction to be made. I think it also partially just comes down to time. Like a state is popping up into a later developmental capacity and dropping down again, right? A stage is being there and staying there most of the time, right? And so it's like, but the way in which, you know, like Terry talks about, Terry O'Fallon talks about um, yeah. the interpenetration of states and stages, right? Where it's like, in order for you to get to later stages, you need to access other states, right? And as you access other states, it kind of, you know, pulls up your stage development. And as you sort of pull up your stage development, you have access to other states, right? So there's kind of like this interweaving happening. And so, you know, a person could have a, a sentence at a certain stage development, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, they can hold that in an entire sort of complex situation where they have to make lots of decisions. Sure. Whereas if you could say, well, actually, from this point to this point over the last and this is where time scales could be really interesting. And we'd want to probably gather some data about this. It's like, well, is an hour speaking at that developmental stage enough for us to be able to tell that they can actually, you know, operate seamlessly at that stage? Or do we actually want to see their profile built over a period of a few weeks or a few months? Where it's like, wow, actually, they're operating at that developmental stage in a lot of different contexts, speaking about different things with different people. Now, that, now we're talking about a robust stage of development. Whereas we could stay talking about one specific topic here for an hour and represent a specific developmental stage when it comes to that context. But now put me in another context where I'm having, you know, um, I'm building friendships with people or um, I'm talking about uh, uh, global dynamics and geopolitics. And then suddenly, you know, maybe I drop into an earlier stage of development. And it's like, okay, well, you know, that is something to be aware of that when this human being gets into those contexts, they're actually operating from a different developmental stage. So built into the smart contract or whatever, we have something that says that in those contexts, that human being hasn't yet unlocked the capacity to be able to make decisions in those contexts about that level of complexity. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious about, you know, I, I think that this kind of a system is not that far away. And as I'm speaking it, there's kind of like the ethical implications coming up for me around like, now we're getting into the sort of the, the hierarchy of certain developmental levels can make certain developmental decisions, right? And others can't. And so there's kind of like coming back to the question of like the architect of the system, like built into the fabric of the system now is a certain stage of development around what development means. And this is where I'd be curious to bring in like different developmental researchers, right? Like I was talking earlier about Theo Dawson and her cognitive complexity versus Terry O'Fallon and, you know, the, the perspective stages. Um, and then maybe even versus, you know, someone like Robert Keegan and his orders of consciousness, right? It's like, how would you build in like a, a collectively sort of designed developmental mechanism as opposed to, well, this is built on this one developmental model which came from one human being, right? It's like, a, how, do we, how do we collectively build in developmental mechanisms that somehow counterbalance each other and show us the, the potential fallibility or, or, or contextual nature of each, right? Because I can, if I construct in my mind right now, the idea that, you know, Theo Dawson's cognitive complexity, there's some areas that cognitive complexity might be really, really valuable, where, for example, perspective may, like there's a, there's a relationship between the two, but they seem to be slightly different. So it's, for me, it's kind of almost like the, the the distinction between science or engineering. Engineering is amazing at sending rockets to the moon, right, with precision. But engineering is not very good for me to decide how to take care of my kids, right? You know, like there's different contexts in which different forms are useful. And so I'd be curious about what forms of like developmental complexity are useful in what contexts. And I'm yet to see any research around that but I'm imagining that as this kind of a system would be built, we'd be able to gather some research around that mm. in the whole building of the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, like what, I mean, each one of those is based on different parameters. So what parameters are, are showing up as being more, I don't know, highly correlated to each context. But the thing I wanna also invite is like, 
what I've been learning over the past couple of years is, um, you know, we're, we're talking a lot, a lot about the constructing side of the system and there's, there's having like the deconstructing side of the system, right? Like I, there's a quote of like, how do you, what's the first thing you build on a really fast car? Like the brakes, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like, um, but what I love is uh, over the past couple of years, I have been um, really using nature uh, as the, as the source of wisdom for how organizations want to, um, uh, how organizational structures could look moving forward. And there's this um, experiment I've been running, I call it deductive structures, but it's where you have a deconstructive function built into the experiment you run. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, we would run a, um, it's almost like an organization, a company forms for like three weeks and then falls away. And so we yeah. run an experiment and then we have a retrospective and we say, okay, what went well, what could have gone better? And then if we want to do this again, what do we want to do different? Mm -hmm. And so just like everything in nature that's born dies, like we, you actually have, like we, we, we actually can build in the death side of what's born. Like everything that's we're creating can get destroyed and we don't need to create stuff that lasts forever. We can say, right. let's run an experiment and then experiments inform experiments. So each time that we run one, we can learn from the last one. But yeah. if anything is getting out of hand, there's also the capacity to always say, okay, this isn't working. Let's let it die. Yeah. And just come back into formless essentially and say, okay, what do we want to create now that we can learn what went well, what could have gone better? Where do we want to go from here? Yeah. Yeah. I love that concept. And um, it's, it's bringing up two things for me. One being the length of time sometimes it takes to build something is longer than initially anticipated mm -hmm. and also um like this this like the compounding that you're talking about of like building experiment upon experiment right like there's a there's iterations right there's and i think that that's one of the directions that our whole conscious ecosystem seems to be moving is towards this accelerating accelerating um iterations right it's like updates are coming faster, right? Kevin Kelly talks a bit about this, right? How it's like, it's like things are getting updated so fast that it's like, you can't keep up with the updates, right? It's like, you know, most things we don't even have to accept the updates anymore because if you had to accept the updates, you'd just be accepting updates every day, right? Um, and so it's like, how, how to balance the two of those? Like the, what it takes time to build things sometimes, right? And also there's this iterative, iterative nature to it. Um, one of the metaphors that came up for me when you were speaking about bringing it back to nature, and I love that we're bringing that back as a as a as a topic to to ground, is the idea of like literally grounding, right? Like you know, even we talk about electricity and grounding it in the ground, so it's like the electricity doesn't get to travel everywhere, right? How does this get grounded back in nature, of being being an organic process. And it seems to me like that's kind of one of the fundamental pieces to all of this is of all the systems that we see on planet Earth right now, the things that get malignant, right? The cancerous corporations or systems or whatever are built so far, so separated from nature that they don't allow that, that healthy integration with it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm curious as you bring that up about how we co-create a system that is so close to nature that it it's it's continually grounded in the organic in the biological in the right um and that that it feels to me is is one of the ways in which we can build in check and balance mechanisms that are potentially ethical because it's like it's tied into planet earth mm -hmm. right it's tied into the entire ecosystem of planet earth whereby the ecosystem is 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 there to protect itself. It's there to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the opposite end of that spectrum is the AI thing I was talking about earlier, where it's like the AI goes amok and it destroys right. everything. Right? right? It's like, how do we keep it close enough to nature that it has that grounding effect, such that it doesn't go too far out too quickly in in a way that a lot of technologies can. Right? That accelerating development of technology that the speed at which it changes and adapts and modifies is like the more that we come back to nature, it seems the more that it will 
holds space for beyond sustainability into regener regeneration, right? Like it's a, a regenerative process that we're trying to create, not an exponential process that goes out into space. Right, right. Yeah, and, and there's, um... I mean, there's a perspective shift, right, of, of like seeing these human systems inside of larger planetary systems. Um, and then um, hmm. I'm just going to add a piece right there, an image that I saw the other day um, of like 48,000 galaxies in this one little slice of the universe that is like a picture of like, you know, somewhere way out there that's been zoomed in. And it's like, just the boggling my mind of like how big the universe is yeah. and how many potential, you know, conscious mm -hmm. species exist out there, which, you know, I currently have no access to. I don't know about other people on planet Earth, um, but it's just like the, the, the vastness of it all was just like, whoa, you know? And just as you mentioned there, the human and the planetary systems and I kind of, you know, my, my awareness went to that and I was kind of like, wow, you know, like this speck that we seem to be in the greater cosmos yeah. of all that is, is like just humbling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's um, this the phrase that keeps coming up for me is like being a, a piece of salt in like an ocean of love. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um and 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 the other thing that was coming up for me too in in seeing these um and i'm i'm sure you're aware of uh frederick lelou's work in reinventing organizations and you know he invites teal and this concept of sense and respond yeah. um instead of command and control with organizations and that's been the other piece that's been fascinating for me in working with later stage organizations like teal and really beyond teal um, mm. is okay or now organizations we're not seeing them as machines we're seeing them as living organisms that have their own consciousness which yeah. means we can listen to them and what do they want to create and what do they want to manifest and what um what do they want to share with us right now mm. and how can we co-create with this unseen consciousness that and um sense into and attune to and um um, collab like collaborate or co-create with as it's moving from unmanifest into manifest. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, it, it brings in terms of sourcing nature's wisdom, it brings all new, um, it brings all new, I mean, it, it's the, my, my last couple of years working in, in post teal organizations has completely blown up every mental model I, I've had about work and organizations because it's like, it's like, okay, now this, now an organization isn't a car that I'm like trying to build to be fast and win a race or not, I need to take into a shop. It's like a baby that like 24 seven, like needs love and care and, and attention and, um, and has needs and, and its own, like its own unique expression of the divine, right? Like its own essence that it's like, um, I'm, I'm having a heartfelt response to the baby metaphor because yeah. it's like um there's some organizations that we let die and i can't do that with babies so. oh. <laughs> well it's 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 the cycle of life right like it's like three weeks in an organizational cycle could be 100 years in the human cycle <laughs> yeah that helps a little yeah, bit yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's um it's uh and yeah, it, it's, uh, I mean, that, we, we're making organizations very human, calling them baby. Another thing I say is gardens, right? Like it's like a garden mm -hmm. that we're cultivating and it's- Sounds a bit better, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting just to, to really wonder into like, if I keep the baby metaphor, it's like, okay, what's it like to take a parenting strategy where I'm imposing my blueprint of what I want you to be as a child, right? Like my child is born, I want you to go to Harvard or Oxford. I want you to be a professional athlete. Or I want you to be a scholar, a professor, a doctor, a lawyer, like- or what's it like to say, okay, here's this human being being born with their own gifts and their own unique expression, their own essence. How can I create a healthy ecosystem for this human being to thrive? And then to do that for other forms of consciousness, like an organization. 
there's a few things coming up for me around that um, in relation to individual versus collective consciousness and the distinctions that are to be made around that. Like if we think about an organization, um, like organization is a collective, right? It's a collective of, you know, usually two plus, you know, um, human beings around a specific, you know, and what Lelou talks about with his evolutionary purpose, right? Like there is this kind of, you know, purpose. And what you're bringing so, up so there. Yes, yes, it's a collective of people and it is an I in the sense it has its own, like it is its own being as well. It's both. Like there's the I made up by the collective of the human beings. It's like, it's a, yeah, it's a new entity. It's a, it's a, it's an end, it's a whole, right? It's an entity that is, that has its own wholeness. And, and yet at the same time, it's, it seems like it's going to be dependent on the, the individuals that are operating within that collective, right? Like that's part of the way in which the collective evolves is to do with who are the individuals that are within that collective that are that are working on developing supporting you know that organization and so the there's the piece that i'm kind of leaning into here is around when you're saying that that's an i like that's an i that is un, inseparable from the individuals that are within the collective that operate that organization right the organization does not exist outside the consciousness of the individuals that operate within that organization. Or uh, that's not fully true. I mean, there's people outside that are aware of it too, right? But it, it like, it's, it's like going back to the metaphor, if a, if a uh, tree falls in a forest and there's nobody there to hear it, you know, does it make a sound, right? That's sort of like, it's all held in human consciousness, right? There is, there is, also physical concrete structures that create get created in an organization maybe we have an office right maybe we build products and those products go out into the world right and so there's 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 physicality there's concreteness there's also the subtlety of the way in which human beings are kind of you know operating within that there's ip and there's certain things the organization is creating right there's the emotions of everything you know of people that are within that organization then there's the kind of the the larger awareness of that organization that it exists and the awareness of the organization itself, right? Like that I that you're talking about is like, what is that, what is that awareness of the organization that sits within the consciousness of the people within the organization and the people without, right? That are holding space for that to be a continued reality. Mm. And how those all kind of come together right from the concrete to the subtle to the awareness right how those all come together into being the metaphor that you just used about children and parenting and going to harvard right where it's like this is something i want for you is like well that's part of it right it's the desire of each individual there's the desire of the consumer or the client of that organization where it's like i pay for that because that's something that i actually want right and the person within that organization that is operating for a specific purpose, which is both to take care of maybe their own financial security and their family, right? Um, and having a vision for where that might go. And so it's like the amalgamation of the interpenetration, the integration of the outside and the inside and how, how that all comes into being, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like the, the leader or the, the, yeah, let's call them the leader of the organization is both sensing into all of that and there's also an evolutionary purpose coming in with it within the leader right that goes beyond just the eye of the organization is because well if i'm holding space as a leader for this organization to come into being then there's something that is coming out of my consciousness that is specific that is maybe what lelou calls that evolutionary purpose which is in addition to sensing into it there's also this kind of this, this directionality to it. And I'm imagining that that's actually the same that happens in parenting, whether we're aware of it or not. I may not want my kids to go to Harvard, right? Or care about that at all. 
But if I'm operating out of integral consciousness, I'm probably going to want my kids to develop, right? Um, if I'm operating later, if I'm operating out of, you know, let's say, you know, the, the construct aware, you know, I probably want that my kids are able to, you know, construct their own identity, right, in the world, right? That that's something that they come up with their own stories about what's true and what's not true. If I'm operating out of, you know, the, the transpersonal, right, or whatever we call it that comes out of after construct aware, I'm going to imagine probably that I would love that my child can come up with entirely new constructions for reality um, at some point in their life. And I'm going to hold space for them in ways that is going to support them to be able to get to that. And if I, you know, so we can keep on going. It's just that the purpose seems to be different, right? Um, like even if we get into some of maybe some of the later pieces where it's like getting into just pure consciousness or light or, you know, allowing everything to come into being in its most natural way, you know, unifying the universe with itself, that's still a purpose, right? That's still a directionality of, of what is, you know, like even with, you know, if we look at what is at the very end, edge of development, I was about to say end, edge of development, um, there's a specific worldview or a specific way of interacting with reality whereby there's a decision-making process to do this over that, right? That unless you are completely immobile in vegetative state, right? There's a decision-making process that happens in the moment, right? Where I choose to pick up the pencil or I choose not to. Right? Those are two decisions. And there's a, there's a certain perspective behind those decisions whereby you know, those decisions are made. And so in the, the, the leader of that organization and holding space, that organization, depending on the kind of stage of development or the level of consciousness or whatever we call it that they're operating from, there's going to be a directionality around that, even if the directionality is let it be completely free flowing and let it have its own direction. That's a form of direction, right? That's saying that this is the intention for the organization is that it's gonna be allowed to flow in the way that it wants to. That's a form of, that's taking a stance. And that's what it seems to me is part of what is required of a leader is that in order for there to be leading that is happening, there is a stance that is taken. So with, so when we get to fourth person perspective and our collective interiors come online, right? Like our, I, like my forestness it is made up of this internal collective, all my different sub, sub personalities, sub personas. And so then if you look at it kind of like a fractal or a nested doll, it's like you get the same thing in an organization. Now, I have my internal collective to my individual eye. Then we have our external collective for the eye of the organization. And so you get this kind of like nested doll thing of, and what's really fascinating, kind of my approach to doing this work has been if you get a bunch of people who are doing the work with their interior collectives and then come together in a later stage organization, how do they work together in an external collective? So if you actually consciously become aware of that, how does that start to unfold? And then I want to talk about free will and choice and all that. I'm thinking maybe that'll be for our next recording. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, There's um, one of the things that's coming up for me in the whole kind of nested doll kind of uh, metaphor is the the kind of the whole the hall of mirrors type. You know, like you know, it keeps world going up, world. fractal yeah. fractalish sort of. You know, and one of the things that seems to happen kind of at the kind of later developmental perspectives or whatever is the kind of the the in the infolding of the internal and the external right the internal external kind of like disappears right oh, where yeah. it's like it's all kind of unified mm -hmm. and that's a curiosity um that's coming up around having these conversations like we're having today and curious about what happens beyond this how, how are these kind of informing, um, how are the 
stages of development which we're sort of operating from and I almost kind of want to transcript this and, and go back and sort of you know developmentally sort of like track see what's kind of come up naturally in the moment um and and I'm, I'm curious about that piece right like even just the eye is coming back in now right like I'm curious right, right. there's a curiosity in me right so like now there's awareness of the, there is an eye that is speaking about this and then there's times when there's not necessarily coming from I, but maybe coming from something that is more of a kind of a, a we are consciousness coming into being and how that models or shifts or shapes what it is that is being communicated about from the perspective of we can talk about concrete things. We can talk about subtle things. We can talk about like objects in awareness. And there are some contexts in which there may not be much even language built around specific pieces like how do you how do you talk about cryptocurrency from a unified perspective right like yeah. mm, uh, uh, monetary anything monetary is sort of still coming back into you know so it's like there's there's sort of linguistic barriers around how certain topics are talked about and what is the perspective that is being come from around that specific topic. Um, but yeah, I will, I will leave it there for today. And I'm, I'm, I'm loving what is emerging here and uh, uh, looking back on what has unfolded and excited to see what, what we can continue to manifest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I'm going to end the recording for here. We'll be back soon. Mm -hmm.